Okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. So we have some uh, fourth year medical students that will be presenting to us today. We're going to start with Kevin Gar, and he's a medical student here at the University of Utah. He's here from Salt Lake, and uh, he's going to be talking about measuring ocular blood flow in glaucoma. Thanks, Brian. Good morning. Um, before I get started, I'd like to thank Dr. Roscoe for helping me get this presentation ready and helping with my slides. So I'll be talking um, about ocular blood flow in glaucoma. So glaucoma is often referred to as the sneak peek of sight um, because it uh, has an insidious onset. It starts in the uh, periphery of the vision, uh, the vision loss, and kind of like you see in this picture here, um, a presentation of what someone with glaucoma, advanced glaucoma, would, would see. Um, it's an optic neuropathy that is characterized by loss of the retinal ganglion um, nerve cells and optic nerve axons. And with glaucoma, the, the vision loss is irreversible and permanent. So patients are often uh, asymptomatic, don't notice the disease until it can be advanced um, and the irreversible damage has already occurred. Um, the, you know, multiple studies have shown that elevated intraocular pressure is correlated with um, the vision loss in glaucoma. And um, it's thought to, to be via compre direct compression on the optic nerve, uh, the lamina curvosa, um, axonal flow leading to the death of the retinal, um, retinal ganglion cells. And uh, you know, studies have shown that reducing ILP is shown to slow vision loss, but not reverse vision loss. But uh, there's a um, subset of patients that even not if you are able to reduce the interocular pressure, they will continue to progress. And there's also a, a subset of patients known as normal tension glaucoma who really never develop elevated interocular pressure, but still have the, the typical um, peripheral vision loss and optic nerve changes. So. You know, there's, there's more going on than, than just IOP. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, you know, possible vascular components. So studies have found a, a higher prevalence of ischemic lesions in the heart, eyes, and brain in, in glaucoma patients. And um, additionally, diseases of the, the blood vessels and, and blood pressure, both hypertension and hypotension, have been associ associated with glaucoma, along with diabetes, um, peripheral artery disease. and. Uh, just with normal tension glaucoma, as, as I was mentioning, the glaucoma patients with that never seem to have an elevated IOP. Um, that form of glaucoma has been associated with vasospastic disease, such as Raynaud's, um, low systemic blood pressure, but in particular, something called ocular perfusion pressure. And the, um, within the last few years, the American Academy of Ophthalmology has actually identified uh, ocular perfusion pressure as a risk factor for glaucoma. Um, so what is ocular perfusion pressure? Just going back to blood flow to any organ, so Q flow is equal to the difference in pressure over resistance. So um, our delta P is also known as the perfusion pressure. And um, in the most simplistic terms, that's just the difference in pressure between the arterial system and the venous system. But uh, in the eye, you can't directly measure those pressures. So ocular perfusion pressure is measured using the mean arterial pressure to estimate the arterial pressure in the eye, and then IOP to estimate venous pressure. Um, that two-thirds basically accounts for the drop-in pressure from the brachial artery, you know, from typical, typical blood pressure reading up to the op ophthalmic artery. But that is, you know, just um, obviously um, an estimate, and that can change if a patient's laying down or um, even sitting. And the IOP is, is not an exact um, measurement of venous pressure. Venous pressure is obviously a little higher to allow flow, but um, a general estimate for uh, venous pressure. And then our um, resistance, I'm not going to really talk about much today, but the, the biggest factor affecting resistance is uh, diameter. Um, if you remember the, the equation, it's um, radius to the fourth. So the diameter of the vessel plays a huge part in that. So a little bit about ocular perfusion pressure in glaucoma. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a few studies that have uh, looked at ocular perfusion pressure in glaucoma patients. And, and the main point here is that ocular perfusion pressure, low ocular perfusion pressure, has been associated both with increased incidence and um, more advanced progression of glaucoma. And, and really the strongest evidence has been for a low diastolic ocular perfusion pressure. So the equation I presented in the last slide which is just looking at the mean ocular perfusion pressure, but that can be broken down into systolic and diastolic. Um, and so, as I mentioned, so it, it's uh, increased with, or associated with um, 
increased incidence and progression of glaucoma. And these were some of the, the bigger studies that have, have been done. Um, so, you know, as we think about that, you know, ocular perfusion pressure is really an estimate. So how can we actually measure um, ocular perfusion in the eye? Um, my interest has been particularly in the, in the choroid. So um, choroid derives its blood supply from the posterior ciliary arteries, and it accounts for the vast majority of blood flow to the eye. Um, it's one of the most vascular areas in the entire human body. Um, and it actually supplies the prelaminar area of the optic nerve, which has been um, implicated in glaucoma. So the first method I want to talk about, possibly um, a way to measure um, ocular perfusion in the choroid is called dynamic contour tonometry. So this is a tonometer, um, pictures of it across the top. It's similar to the Goldman, except the actual tip of the tonometer is, is curved to fit the eye rather than a flat raplination. And um, another difference is it's actually able to measure um, the waveform of IOP. So just like blood pressure, IOP is dynamic. It, um, and when we're taking it, we're measuring it at one point in time, but uh, it changes just as blood pressure does. So this is kind of a, a typical um, reading that the dynamic contour tonometer shows. This is um, an example from a machine called the Pas Pascal. And you can see there's, there's this waveform. And um, particularly, it gives you a measurement called OPA, or ocular pulse amplitude. And all that means is it's the difference between the maximum IOP at, during systole and the minimum IOP during diastole. And um, there's been a lot of interest in how ocular pulse amplitude um, could be related to blood flow. And so it's thought to indirectly represent the, the choroidal perfusion because it gives you that pulsatile component of blood flow. Um, and a lot of studies, I just want to kind of highlight a couple, but a lot of studies have looked at this in glaucoma, and um, Schwen suggested that it could be an independent risk factor um, for the presence of normal tension glaucoma, and especially when they compared it to just a primary angle, primary open angle glaucoma in patients that did have elevated pressures and ocular hypertension. Additionally, it's actually been found to correlate with severity of the disease um, as defined by cup to disc ratios and, and visual fields. Um, so another method that I want to talk about is um, choroidal thickness. So um, early histological studies back in the 60s and 70s um, looked at choroids um, post-mortem and found um, that they were thinner and had a reduced density of vessels, um, but really they weren't able to get a good in vivo look um, until a few years ago. Um, Dr. Spade um, talk, uh, published some papers about what, what he called enhanced stem enhanced depth imaging, and that is a uh, mode used on the OCT that actually allows visualization of the anterior and posterior boundary of the choroid, and um, he used enhanced depth imaging to actually measure choroidal thickness, and his studies mainly looked um, in healthy patients, and they found in healthy patients that choroidal thickness was strongly correlated with age and axial length. Um, interestingly, axial length has also been correlated to um, intraocular pressure. So. Um, this is kind of an example of an image acquired from um, enhanced depth imaging on OCT. And these red lines are just delineating the um, borders of the choroid for a measurement. So here's the anterior border just below the retinal pigment epithelium, and then the border between the choroid and the sclera. And you can really actually get a pretty good view on most patients um, of the choroid. So a little bit about some studies that have looked at um, choroidal thickness and glaucoma. There's been some disagreement over whether there actually is a relationship um, between um, glaucoma via incidence or uh, severity and the choroidal thickness. Um, I'm highlighting a few studies that identified um, some differences, although there were that did not find any difference. Um, and really, it's, it's, it's hard to compare the studies side to side because most of these um, studies had different groups. So some stu one study looked at um, glaucoma suspects versus um, glaucoma patients in general. Most did not differentiate between um, glaucoma patients with elevated intraocular pressure and normal tension glaucoma patients. Um, and most of these studies were cross-sectional. There was this one by Cara that actually looked at um, patients before and after trabeculectomy and found that the decrease in IOP corresponded with an increase in choral thickness. But really, where the best evidence seems to be if there is a difference would be in the parapapillary region, which would make sense um, you know, around the optic disc, although some 
um, to find a difference in, in the submacular, subfoveal um, choroid. So a little uh, about um, my interest in research. So I've been working with Dr. Roscoe and Dr. Petty, and we have an ongoing study here at Moran where we are, are looking at um, both ocular pulse amplitude and fertile thickness. And we're looking to compare it um, to known um, risk factors for glaucoma and, and indicators of disease, disease severity. So we're actually splitting into patients into three groups, primary open angle glaucoma, patients with elevated intraocular pressures um, at time of diagnosis, normal tension glaucoma patients. So patients who have never in their medical record had a elevated intraocular pressure and then healthy controls, we think that will best allow us to um, detect a difference. And we're comparing parapapillary and um, subfoveal um, choroidal thickness as uh, um, demonstrated in these two pictures um, in patients, comparing that both with ocular pulse amplitude, ocular perfusion pressure, um, uh, visual fields, um, and uh, um, IOP, just very uh, various indicators of um, glaucoma in patients and um, hoping to, to better identify if there is a relationship both between severity of glaucoma, ocular perfusion pressure, and these, these two new methods of possibly measuring it, of ocular pulse amplitude and choroidal thickness. Um, so here are my references. Are there any questions? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So, I mean, that, that's been the problem with a lot of cross-sectional studies. You can you know, identify possible risk factors, but really hard to identify is this actually a, a causative, is it just associated? So, I mean, ideally, you know, if, if you're able to identify a, a difference in a cross-sectional study, would be to follow these patients forward in time um, and see if you can correlate the changes in, in their pulse amplitude and choroidal thickness with actually changes in the disease. Um, does that answer your question? Dr. Olson. So, really, you do all these incredible correlation studies of epidemiological long tail. Do you believe that's a huge membrane? Two Cs, causation and correlation, may be the same thing, but such studies have no way of telling us which one is more correct. And so,
Yeah, I think the, one of the studies, the Haruka study, they actually the identified in normal tension, so those patients did not have interocular elevated pressures and they were still able to um, find a difference. But that's a good point. A lot of the studies lost their significance when they um, actually controlled for IOP. Thank you. 